America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on Pakistan. Our guest is Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, who prior to becoming a U.S. citizen, served as the Ambassador of Pakistan to the United States from 2008 to 2011. Ambassador Haqqani began his career in journalism before advising three Pakistani prime ministers and later serving as Pakistan's ambassador to Sri Lanka. He was a professor of international relations at Boston College and has authored several books on Pakistani foreign and domestic politics. His most recent book, Magnificent Delusions, Pakistan, the United States, and An Epic History of Misunderstanding is on the Battlegrounds recommended reading list. Ambassador Haqqani is now a director for South and Central Asia at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C. The Islamic Republic of Pakistan is the world's fifth most populous country. It sits atop the Indian subcontinent and shares borders with Iran, Afghanistan, China, and India. Islam was introduced to the region in the 7th century, and a succession of Islamic dynasties controlled swaths of the subcontinent from the 11th to 18th centuries. The British Empire consolidated political power over the areas of modern-day India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh in the 19th century through arrangements with local rulers. As nationalist and independence segments grew, Muslim politicians in the north formed the Muslim League to represent the interests of the minority Muslim community in British India. In 1947, after years of peaceful struggle against colonial rule, led by Mahatma Gandhi, Britain departed India. During the Great Migration that followed independence and partition, over one million people were killed, and more than 15 million people displaced. The former colony was partitioned along religious lines into the independent states of East and West Pakistan and India. Pakistan and India fought four wars before the end of the 20th century. They clashed directly over the disputed region of Jammu and Kashmir in wars in 1947 and 1965, and in a border conflict in the heights of Kargil in 1999. In 1971, the Pakistani military, with the support of the U.S. and China, fought India and its partner the Soviet Union in a war which resulted in the inception of the state of Bangladesh. Pakistan hosts militant and terrorist groups who engage in an ongoing proxy fight against Indian security forces and conduct acts of terrorism in Indian-administered Kashmir, as well as other parts of India. Coups, corruption, and assassinations have disrupted Pakistan internally. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the founder of the center-left Social Democratic Political Party, the PPP, or Pakistan People's Party, was hanged following a military coup by General Zia al-Haq. In 1988, President Zia al-Haq, who fostered Pakistan's identity as an Islamic state and facilitated Mujahideen militia resistance to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan for eight years, died in a plane crash. Benazir Bhutto, the daughter of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, was elected as the country's first female prime minister. She served two terms as prime minister, spent over a decade living in exile fighting corruption charges, and was assassinated in Ralpindi in a suicide bombing while campaigning for a third prime ministerial term in 2007. In 1999, General Parvez Musharraf seized power in a military coup. After the mass murder attacks of September 11, 2001, General Musharraf pledged to assist the United States in the subsequent war against the Taliban, al-Qaeda, and other jihadist terrorist organizations. Thus began a confounding period of U.S.-Pakistani relations, during which Pakistan posed as an ally of the United States and accepted U.S. military and economic assistance, 
while supporting the Taliban and other terrorist organizations that perpetuated the war in Afghanistan. After Musharraf stepped down in 2008 to avoid impeachment, subsequent Pakistani leaders pledged to go after jihadist terrorist groups less selectively. But the Pakistani army was and remains in control of Pakistan's military and foreign policy. The complex relationship between the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency and the Pakistani Army's shadowy intelligence arm, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, or ISI, began during the Mujahideen resistance to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. But the legacy of the Mujahideen victory over Soviet occupation thrust Afghanistan into a destructive civil war and perpetuated a jihadist terrorist ecosystem astride the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Pakistan has a long relationship with China, and its economic and financial dependence on China is deepening. U.S.-Pakistan policy might be described as serial gullibility, based on the false assumption that Pakistan would, based on U.S. assistance and diplomatic requests, end or dramatically reduce its support for the Taliban, the Haqqani Network, and other terrorist organizations. But Pakistan has used jihadist terrorists as an arm of its foreign policy and as a way to threaten its much larger neighbor India since 1947. A recent example of the terrorist threat to India was the 2008 Mumbai attacks carried out by Lashkari Teba across four days in which at least 164 civilians were killed and more than 300 people were wounded. Pakistanis have also suffered from what their army helped create. Thousands have died in the last two decades at the hands of ISIS-K and the tariq i taliban in attacks across Pakistan, including the horrible killing of over 130 students at an army school in Peshawar in 2014. Pakistan and India are both nuclear powers, and it is the combination of jihadist terrorists and nuclear weapons that make Pakistan one of the most dangerous places on Earth. We welcome Ambassador Haqqani to discuss Pakistani foreign policy, the current state of security and counterterrorism in the country, and the future of South Asia as the humanitarian, political, and security crisis unfolds following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, welcome to Battlegrounds. Let me begin by saying how much I've admired your service over the years and how glad I am uh, that you are an American citizen because you've strengthened our country and, and of course, deepened our understanding of dynamics in, in South Asia. It's wonderful to, to have you on Battlegrounds. Thank you very much, HR. It's always been a pleasure knowing you and working with you. Well, Ambassador, I thought I'd begin by, of course, talking about what, what I view as a, as a humanitarian, a political, and a and a security catastrophe in Afghanistan. And as we watched the Taliban take over Afghanistan and, and just the beginning, I think, of this humanitarian crisis, what do you think are the, the long-term consequences uh, in, in South Asia and beyond? General, there are at least three. The first, of course, is the humanitarian. The Afghan people will suffer enormously. Uh, the Taliban are totally unchanged. Uh, the promises of them having moderated are proving to be absolutely false. Uh, the Taliban are executing people for even minor crimes. Uh, they are insisting that women not get higher education and not even higher education, even secondary education. So they are allowed to go to school only up to grade six. Uh, they don't want women in the workplace. Uh, they are looking for uh, people they consider to be their enemies, and they are going to definitely eliminate them. Uh, they will also run a sectarian, uh, 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 a sectarian terror by eliminating Shia Muslims and any religious minorities that they might find. The people of Afghanistan are already voting with their boots by leaving the country or trying to leave the country. So they will have, and then Afghanistan is on the verge of a drought. Uh, it's uh, uh, economic resources primarily came from donor funding that has been suspended, even if the donors continue to provide humanitarian assistance by way of food and medicine, there will be huge problems going forward about keeping Afghanistan economically going and therefore the people of Afghanistan not suffering. The second part of it is uh, that the Taliban have said that they will not let Afghanistan be used 
for attacks on other countries, but they have not said that they will not allow Islamist jihadist groups from other countries to organize in Afghanistan. And their refusal to accept that bin Laden was behind 9-11, which is something they have reiterated only recently, shows that their interpretation of what constitutes waging an attack on another country is very different from our understanding of that. So there will be all kinds of jihadist groups that will start uh, concentrating in Afghanistan and operating from there. Uh, more important for uh, the countries in the region will be how the Taliban do not restrain jihadist groups that attack inside India and possibly the jihadist groups that try to destabilize the Central Asian countries like the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan that attacks in Uzbekistan, the Tajikistan Islamist groups, etc. And so the neighbors will have, and even the Pakistani Taliban, who probably will continue to get support from the Afghan uh, Taliban. So there will be a rise in terrorism and definitely more in the region, but possibly even beyond. Lastly is the strategic dimension. I think that those who said that leaving Afghanistan uh, will free America to focus on China, basically forgot that China is not just a power that has interests in East Asia, but it also has interests in West Asia and South Asia. And its borders do come all the way to this region. So China has a little tip that actually touches the Afghanistan border. It has a common border with Pakistan. And China is going to become the Taliban's major development partner. That's what the Taliban say. So now the US will not have a base in Afghanistan. It does not have military bases in the Central Asia because the Central Asian countries are averse to annoying either the Russians or the Chinese. Pakistan has already become very unreliable from the point of view of the US. Iran is antagonistic. And if you see on the map, that creates a very huge portion of uh, uh, the globe where China will have much more influence than the United States. And so in humanitarian terms, in terms of containing terrorism and Islamist extremism, and in terms of the strategic picture vis-a-vis -vis China, the loss of Afghanistan is going to come back and bite the United States. You know, Ambassador, what's striking about, about your summary of these consequences is I don't think that the, the American government, that U.S., U.S. leaders under the Trump administration and the Biden administration really considered these consequences and they failed to mainly based on self-delusion, I would say, in, in three areas that you've alluded to, right? That, that, that the Taliban had somehow changed, right? And they would, they would put in a, some kind of a new and more benign form of, of Sharia. Or, or secondly, that there was this bold line, right, between, between the Taliban and other jihadist terrorist organizations that really pose a threat to, to all humanity. And then, and then third, that there wouldn't be geostrategic consequences beyond Afghanistan. And of course, all three of those assumptions were fundamentally flawed and based on what we might call strategic narcissism. But if I might go to your superb book, Magnificent Delusions, also, I, th I think what was not adequately considered was the role of the Pakistani military and the connections with the Taliban. It seemed clear to me, and I, I'm anxious to hear your assessment, that the offensive in Afghanistan that collapsed Afghan security forces and the Afghan government after we delivered these psychological blows right to the to the psyche of, uh, of those forces in the government was planned and supported by the inner services intelligence the intelligence arm of the pakistani army and and could you please maybe characterize for our leaders you know how you know the nature of that offensive and and uh, and the degree to which you think the isi and and the pakistani military were complicit in it uh, first of all let me just start by the delusions i think the delusions came from a bumper sticker. Uh, President Trump made that bumper sticker into his policy President Biden followed, which was no forever wars. So therefore, they were only thinking of one thing. How do we end America's involvement in this quote-unquote forever war? And so when Mr. Zalme Khalilzad came up with the idea that I can talk to the Taliban and we can cut a deal with the Taliban, something he has advocated going back to 1996, uh, when the Taliban were in power, uh, they bought into it. And so the assumption was that the Taliban representatives in Doha were the ones who were talking for the entire movement. It became a con. America signed a deal with the Taliban, but not with the Afghan government. That was a big blow to the Afghan government. Word got round in the countryside that the Americans have cut a deal with the Taliban to withdraw. 
but it's not just a withdrawal deal it's also a support deal for the taliban beyond the withdrawal so that caused the serious morale problems for the uh, uh, military then of course uh, they needed contractors for the high tech equipment that the united states had given them and the afghans couldn't manage that equipment without the contractors president biden withdrew those contractors along with the us forces all of a sudden the america uh, the afghan air force cannot fly the americans are not doing support missions from the air and a military that has now been trained to fight with air support is having to fight without air support so no wonder it collapsed but we must remember that the taliban have had a base in pakistan throughout the war uh, the united states spoke about it but it never made a policy about it i would argue that the only american policy was to somehow call the pakistani ambassador into the state department i did that role played that role for 3 and a half years or send an american uh, delegation to islamabad and lecture the pakistanis lecturing is not the same as actually influencing somebody else's policy you can lecture uh, somebody as much as you like and saying hey we are not very happy with the fact that you are supporting the taliban but the us never actually implemented any policy that would make pakistan pay a heavy price for that and pakistan had a, an end game planned while the us did not and the end game was first of all they have an overlapping uh, overlapping ethnic group the pashtuns uh, they are very close to uh, uh, what is happening in afghanistan so they have granular details of what's happening on ground that the americans did not and they knew that this is how the collapse will come they planned for it and that is why the pakistani uh, isi chief went to kabul right after the collapse of the ghani uh, uh, government and before the taliban announced their own government because he had some things to advise them about we must remember that uh, admiral Mac- uh, admiral mullen who was the uh, mike mullen who was the chairman of the joint chiefs said in 2011 that the haqqani network which is an integral part of the taliban the via the the uh, network's chief is the deputy amir of the taliban that the haqqani network is a veritable arm of the isi so the veritable arm is now very much in control six out of the 33 cabinet portfolios have gone to the haqqani network 17 out of the 33 cabinet portfolios in the new taliban cabinet have gone to people who are on the united, uh, united nations uh, terrorist uh, designated terrorists list and the preparation with which the taliban moved in they never accepted a ceasefire Uh, they never stopped fighting and they clearly had a plan that they had tremendous mobility they had a much better firepower and they had a strategic plan that they implemented uh, that r- w- was quite clearly the plan not of a guerrilla army but of a uh, conventional army now if you remember you've written a book on this yourself uh, vietnam uh, in the end in the end the march of Saig- on saigon was not not just the viet cong that march was fully aided abetted and helped by the north vietnamese and that's exactly what happened here because towards the end even a guerrilla force needs a conventional military to establish control over territory and to get uh, get control of cities and pakistan support was crucial in that stage You know, and, and as you mentioned, it was actually in some ways worse than 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 Vietnam in 1975 when we withdrew all support from the South Vietnamese armed forces, because as you mentioned, on, on the way out of Afghanistan, we delivered these blows to the Afghans, not including them in the negotiations, not insisting on a ceasefire, forcing the Afghan government to release 5,000 of the most heinous terrorists and criminals uh, on earth, and then as you mentioned. withdrawing you're the support and those 5000 uh, for, for them uh, yeah exactly yeah go ahead go prisoners ahead. those 5000 prisoners would have been leverage for the afghan government in their talks with the taliban so basically the americans were saying or mr khalil zad was saying that uh, the real uh, peace will be made between the afghan government and the afghan taliban but we will tie the afghan government's hands before the afghan government can talk to the taliban and that was very unfair It, well, and and so in, instead of just leaving we actually you know we actually empowered the Taliban and weakened the Afghan government security forces on the way out and you know i i'd like to talk a little bit more about us policy toward toward pakistan i mean i i described this in 
in battlegrounds as serial gullibility. And, and, and you, you have probably the best view uh, of this long relationship and, and can maybe help us diagnose why did we never really hold Pakistani leadership to account for continuing to, uh, to, to subvert the, our efforts in Afghanistan to attack not only you know, Afghan security forces, but U.S. forces and innocent civilians on, on a continuous basis. And, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about what Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, said, uh, praising the Taliban as Kabul fell for breaking the shackles of slavery is the way he put it. And I'm thinking of your your July article in Foreign Affairs, where you observe that, you know, that that uh, that, that the, the Pakistani security establishment is celebrating the Taliban's success now, but they're, they're going to come to regret it, right? Because it's going to leave Pakistan vulnerable to extremism. So to many Americans who say it doesn't seem logical, right? Why would Pakistan engage in what really is in some ways self-destructive behavior? Can you can you help explain kind of the, the long history of Pakistani army's support for the Taliban and, 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 and why this is the case? So, yes, I will. And but before I do that, let me explain the gullibility. You see, there is an American assumption that everybody in the world wants the same things. Everybody wants a nice car. Everybody wants a nice house with the mortgage fully paid off. Everybody wants a retirement plan. Everybody wants their children uh, to go to a good college and get a good job. And then everybody wants to play with grand grandchildren when they grow old. Um, and, uh, and and in between have decent meals, some fast food and some good ones. Um, that That is not always the case. The Amir of the Taliban, Mullah Hebatullah Khunsada, he blessed his youngest son to become a suicide bomber. Just think about it for a moment. No, right, right, exactly. What else do you need to know, Hussein? Right? When yeah, people talk exactly. about how our interests are aligned with the Taliban, it just right. it drives me crazy. So, so this it. man does certainly doesn't believe and think like an average American. He wants something very different from life than what the average American wants. Now that is exactly what has happened between the United States and Pakistan. Uh, First of all, Pakistan is a new country. It was created in 1947 out of old cloth. There was no Pakistan in history that had won independence. It was a, a part of British India. And as the British are leaving, the Muslim majority parts become Pakistan and the Hindu majority parts become India. Uh, but historically, half of what is today Pakistan was either under Afghanistan or under self-rule, and the other half was part of India in one form or another. So therefore, because it's a new country, its biggest challenge is how to create its own identity as a country. And the country has created its identity on the basis of uh, antagonism towards India, but also antagonism towards ethnic nationalism within the country. Now, the Pashtuns, of the northwest of Pakistan, who have a shared ethnicity with the Pashtuns of Afghanistan, were very reluctant to join Pakistan. In fact, they voted against joining Pakistan in 1946 in the elections that the British had held, after which they decided that they are going to partition the subcontinent. So Pakistan has always thought that the best way to contain Pashtun nationalism which Afghanistan used to support, especially uh, under the king, and then later on, even under the communists, would and, be and not, not recognizing the Duran line that separates not like the recognizing the Pakistan Afghanistan. And I'll, just, I'll just point out, Hussein, this is such good explanation. I think just our viewers should know two thirds of the Pushtun ethnic Pushtun population is in Pakistan rather than now, Afghanistan. Yeah, there was a time when there were more Pashtuns in Afghanistan then in Pakistan, but now after all the waves of immigration, of refugees, etc., Pakistan has two-thirds of the Pashtun population, Afghanistan only one-third. So Pakistan has always thought that Afghanistan will be the base of any attempt by India to subvert the idea of Pakistan by encouraging Pashtun nationalism in Pakistan and Baluch nationalism in Pakistan. Baluchistan also has a shared border with Afghanistan. And maybe there are some people who say that maybe the Indians and the Afghans quietly did support with money or resources some of these nationalist movements, which are very genuinely rooted in Pakistan. So the Pakistan military's plan for Afghanistan throughout, throughout, going back to before the Soviets came in, has been to try and encourage Islamism in Afghanistan, because if instead of nationalism, the Afghans think in Islamist terms, then it's easier for them to accept the supremacy or the preeminence of Pakistan 
which has more of a population, more Muslims, and also has an army which is now armed with nuclear weapons. So they will defer to Pakistan more than a nationalist Afghan government would. Now, the U.S. has always ended up assuming that the Pakistanis should think like we do. They should be rational. They should think they can't compete with India. So they will eventually give that up, but they won't. And there's, a, uh, there, there's some very good books on the subject about how the Pakistan military mind works. They don't see many military defeats at the hands of India as enough uh, to end that. They think, no, our priority is still to continue to compete with India to keep our nation together. And the same goes for Afghanistan. So the gullibility you talk about is based on uh, the American assumption that we can persuade Pakistan to change its priorities. And what are Pakistan's priorities? You heard them. Prime Minister Imran Khan, when he says that they have broken the shackles of slavery, what he basically means is they have gone for their Islamist roots and identity. And Pakistan prefers an Islamist identity for Afghanistan and for itself than a nationalist identity because Pakistan's own nationalist identity is relatively weak. And now why are they insisted on this? Despite the fact that Pakistan has suffered economically for it. I've written a whole book on how Pakistan has economically suffered. Pakistan has the lowest literacy rate of the major powers of South Asia. Uh, you know, Bangladesh, which became independent from Pakistan in 1971, now has a 73% literacy rate. India has a 77% literacy rate. And Pakistan's literacy rate hovers around 57%, if that. Uh, GDP, Bangladesh's GDP, has, which used to be, I don't know if you remember, when Bangladesh became independent in 1971, it was a very poor country. And it was described as a basket case because it had no uh, serious uh, economy. And its economy was a, a, a fraction of Pakistan's. Now, Bangladesh's GDP is larger than that of Pakistan. And anybody else who was thinking purely rationally would say Pakistan needs to stop its conflict, or at least defer its conflict with India, focus at home, get its literacy rate higher, make its economy more productive, instead of playing games and acting like a regional superpower. But that's not how the Pakistan military thinks, because it is in charge. It does not have civilians on top of it. Imran Khan, in particular, is more of a nominal prime minister than most, because he derives his strength from the military, which helped him win the election. Uh, and so his views, his personal views, plus the views that the military ad advises him to have result in seeing everything through a very narrow prism of Pakistan's strategic interest is competing with India, dominating Afghanistan, and keeping the flag of Islamism high in the region, because that's the only way Pakistan continues to be a strong country in their view. You know, Hussein, when I, was, when I was National Security Advisor, I was determined to break this cycle of serial gullibility. You know, and I, I traveled uh, I, tra I traveled to South Asia uh, in April of 2017, and I delivered a pretty strong message to, to General Bajwa uh, and Naveed Mukhtar. And, and, uh, and what I tried to do is to lay out the future of Pakistan if they continue on this path of using jihadist terrorists as an arm of their foreign policy and, and taking on these jihadist terrorist groups only selectively. Because, of course, it blows back on Pakistan. We all know that lashkar e taiba which is an, an arm of the ISI, uh, portions of that organization have morphed into Tariqi into Taliban Pakistan. Portions of Tariqi Taliban Pakistan have morphed into ISIS Khorasan. And so these groups are threats to Pakistan as much as they Absolutely. are. To, to others. They think and they so can manage the threats. Uh, HR, they think they can manage the threats. They think that at the look, even now, the Pakistani state apparatus fears people like me, whom they see as advocates of a secular Pakistan, more than they feel threatened by the Islamists who actually have set off bombs and launch terrorist attacks against the military and what, against the, civilian the, the targets. School, do, would, you, would you mind recapping for our viewers the school bombing, which I thought might be a turning point? Well, uh, yeah, it was the army public school in uh, Peshawar. Uh, armed gunmen showed up and just mowed down uh, several hundred children uh, who were in the school. And the idea was to give a message to the Pakistani military to stop military action against the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban. Um, 
And, and after that incident, of course, there was a lot of rhetoric in Pakistan and there was some action against the TTP. But again, the action was against specific individuals and groups. And it was not as strong as the action against, say, Baluch nationalists or Sindhi nationalists or Pashtun nationalists or Pakistani secularists. And the reason is simple. The reason is that the Islamists are seen as allies in the long-term project of defining Pakistan. And how do you define Pakistan? These are eth different ethnic groups. The only thing that binds them together is that they are Muslim. And the other thing that binds them together is that for the last 73 years, they have been in one country. And about 100 years before that, they were under British rule together. But other than that, their histories are different, their cultures are different, their languages are different. The other way of doing putting them together would have been to have a federal government in which everybody has their local autonomy and then there is a central strong uh, government that provides certain uh, security uh, to the state. But that has not been the case. Uh, the terms under which Pakistan came about created a very unusual situation. Pakistan got 17% of British India's resources, 19% of British India's population, but 33% of British India's army. And this army did not have much equipment. So the, the first objective of the army, instead of deciding that, okay, well, you know, we are a new country, it's smaller. This is not, the British had raised this army to fight the Second World War. Uh, we don't need to fight another world war, so we should scale it down. Instead of doing that, Pakistan's leaders decided that that army will become part of the national narrative. Now, most countries raise an army uh, proportionate to the threat that they face. Pakistan had a huge army, so it had to create a threat proportionate to the size of the army. And that is what Pakistan has been dealing with for the last 73 years. The American mistake in all of this has been the assumption that since this army is very well trained, it's of senior officers speak English, uh, they've been trained in the British way, that they will and they say all the right things. We fight. And they the serve. And they field. serve. They serve great scotch, by the way. Also, the same. Well, uh, I'm. I'm sure <laughs> they do. I have. I have not partaken of their scotch, so I have no. I, I have no idea. But I'm sure they do. But that's a British tradition. So the assumption was always during the Cold War that they are our allies because they said all the right things uh, during the war against the Soviets. They allowed us to arm and equip the mujahideen. And then again after 9/11. When General Musharraf came to America and said, okay, I've changed sides and I'm now on your side. The assumption always was Pakistan will change. And I, as you know, have always argued that while it is desirable for Pakistan to change in terms of American policy, American policy should also provide for the reality that maybe Pakistan has not changed or is not changing. And if it's not changing, then what do we do with it? And right. that was not done throughout this period. Right, and, and again, I think it's it's due to what you what you identified as mirror imaging and what we might call also a lack of strategic empathy, and in particular, understanding the ideology and emotion that drives and constrains others. And I think it really met its height during the Obama administration when there was this idea, right, that we could really not worry about Afghanistan and instead partner with Pakistan against Al Qaeda uh, and these and these other groups. And of course. I think we, we stamped that down a bit in the Trump administration early, but it returned with a vengeance. And I couldn't believe it when I saw when I saw uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan sitting in the Oval Office with President Trump after I left the job as national security advisor. Because and there's always this assumption that we can talk to somebody. Yes. And I'm not against talks, honestly. Uh, strategically, I think it's a sensible way to conduct business. There should be diplomacy. But here's the point. A diplomat's task is not only to tell the other side what you want and hear what they want, but also to make an assessment of to what extent is the other side flexible. Now, if the other, when you went there and you talked to General Padua and to General Naveed Mukhtar, uh, who was the head of the ISI at that time, you probably came back and had to make an assessment, maybe even if it was for 20 minutes sitting on the plane quietly, going over what they said, and then you had to make an assessment how much of it was going to be true, how much of it did they mean, how much of it will they be able to do, how much of it do, do they have the capacity to do. The, 
mistake that the American sort of diplomats sometimes make is that they assume that we have delivered a rational mass message. The other side has said, hmm, yeah, it makes sense. We'll talk, we'll think about it. Therefore, that means that they will do it. And if you think of, if you see that, there's a pattern whether it's Saddam Hussein, whether it's Hafiz al-Assad and Bashar al-Assad, there is a pattern of assuming that just because we are talking to them, they are talking to us, they are being hospitable to us, as you said, they are serving us good scotch, and they are listening to us, that they will do what we are telling them to do. Instead of reading the fine print of the local press, seeing what messages are being sent to the society, and how the people and politicians are receiving them and thinking about them, what's the domestic uh, direction of the, uh, of, of the polity, and then decide, will they really do what they say they will do? And if they won't, what is our plan for that? And I think that plan was never made in respect to Pakistan. Oh, I, and I think if they're masterful, the Pakistani leadership is masterful at playing to people's egos, as you're alluding to, right? Our generals, our admirals, our diplomats, like, hey, I'm going to really be the person that's going to convince Pakistani leaders that it is in their interest to change their behavior. And I wonder if you might just summarize for our viewers, because you've done it so well in, in, in Magnificent Delusions, kind of the longer the longer history of, of U.S.-Pakistani relations. You wrote, I think, in 2013, that the alliance was ill-fated and not worthwhile for either country's interests because of what you've laid out here. But there were times when, when U.S. relations with Pakistan were close. During the Cold War, the role that Pakistan played in facilitating Henry Kissinger's secret diplomatic mission to Beijing in the, in the 1970s, or when we worked together uh, it, it, with, uh, to support the Mujahideen resistance to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Of course, that was problematic during the time of Zia al haq and, and the way it set conditions for the problems that we've had in Afghanistan and, and in the region since then. Of course, the relationship was tense at times, especially over Pakistan's nuclear program and the AQ Khan network and, and proliferation. But, but could, you, could you draw out a, little, a few of these themes and times in the relationship? And so let, me, let me begin by saying that I always refer to the starting point when Pakistan was created. As I said, big army, fewer resources, Army didn't have uh, material or equipment. So Pakistan came to the U.S. primarily to get make up for all its deficits, get the equipment for the military that already existed, and get uh, funding for its economy. Um, and the U.S. assumption was that once we provide that, then this large standing army, well-trained by the British, which has fought the Second World War, will be useful for us in Korea, in Vietnam. Of course, the Pakistani objective throughout was to get itself on its feet to be able to compete with India. Um, now, some would argue in Pakistan, with some reason, that Pakistan felt threatened by India. And I'm not one who says that no that a country should not plan for its own security. But it should be a rational plan. If you see the pattern of the last many years, most of the wars with India have been initiated by Pakistan rather than by India. Uh, most countries trade with countries with whom they have disputes. Pakistan has a dispute with India over Kashmir, but Pakistan does not trade with India, does not allow tourists from India or Pakistanis to go to India. And the reason, I think, is not just security. It is identity. And the Americans never got that. They always assumed. So, it's also, so the nuclear program, when Pakistan started developing a nuclear program, the American assumption was, oh, they feel insecure vis-a-vis -vis India, especially after the loss of East Pakistan, which in 1971 became Bangladesh. And with the help of India, because India supported the independence movement in Bangladesh, it was a genuine independence movement, but supported by the Indians towards the end. And so Pakistan now halved, half the original size, less than half the population. Well, maybe it's their security. So the American response was, let's give them more conventional weapons so they stopped the nuclear program. But instead, of course, they took the conventional and still went ahead with the nuclear, which is what they were going to do anyway. And there was a uh, presumption that Pakistan would change. Against the Soviets also in Afghanistan, the Americans failed to recognize that Pakistan's support for the more Islamist groups was motivated by its own considerations. Not the Amer so 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 the real problem in this relationship, and that's why I call it magnificent delusions, is that the Americans assume that they will be able to bring Pakistan round to their objectives, 
And the Pakistanis know that they have very clear different objectives, which they will fulfill with American assistance. And so that is why this relationship has gone the way it has. Then again, after 9-11, General uh, Musharraf, who was the military dictator at the time, felt that uh, the Americans are so angry that they will come knocking at Pakistan's door, sort of, you know, and maybe thumping us. So therefore, we should side with them in bringing the Taliban down. But Musharraf, in his own assessment, something that he has written in his own book, thought that the Americans will be in Afghanistan for just a couple of years. So they were indulging the American desire for revenge against Al-Qaeda. And so they rounded up all the usual Al-Qaeda people that they could find, the usual suspects, and handed them over to America to send to Guantanamo. They didn't realize that the war will drag on as long. So once they realized after two years that the Americans are going to stay longer to build a new society and a new government in Afghanistan, then they started supporting the Taliban again. And so the the American-Pakistani relationship has been essentially a relationship in which the two sides have had different objectives. And the commonality of interest has been very limited, but instead of understanding that limited common, common interest, the Americans have assumed that this is a broad strategic partnership. And Pakistanis, to be fair to them, can also say that sometimes they have also made the mistake of assuming that since we are America's partners against, the, against communism, America will be our partner against India, which never played out that way. The way forward for the two countries would be to continue to engage with one another, deal with one another as, as two countries that do not have a 100% identity of views, but at the same time, maybe engage in some transactional arrangements about where they can work together, but be aware that there are these huge strategic divergences of what each side expects and wants. And the, now those divergences have increased. Pakistan is a close ally of China and an adversary of India. India is an American ally and the US interest is in India's rise rather than in uh, somehow undermining of India. And lastly, of course, Jihadism. So right now, there are three divergences of interest between Pakistan and the United States, Pakistan's nuclear program, terrorism, and the uh, uh, global order in terms of who should be the leader. Pakistan accepts Chinese leadership of the global order. India wants to resist it. India is America's ally. Pakistan considers India a permanent enemy. With those divergences, it's not going to be easy to have a strategic partnership or a partnership more than one in which there is some transactional give and take. You know, in my conversations with uh, with Pakistani leaders, I would try to point out that that the other client states of, of China, when you consider that picture, it's not a pretty picture. It's, it's Absolutely. It's, By the way, General Bajwa has acknowledged that. General Bajwa, who's the current Pakistan yes. army chief, acknowledges Yes. Uh, both publicly and privately, that it may not be in Pakistan's interest to put all its eggs in China's basket. But here's the problem. Uh, the basket of uh, the, 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 the rela any relationship is a basket of issues. And in the basket of issues right now, Pakistan has more of an overlap with China than it does with the United States. And the US has more of an overlap with India. The ideal of Pakistan understanding that while its population difference with India is one is to six, its economy size difference is one is to 11. Uh, India has 2.9 trillion economy. Pakistan has a 280 billion economy. The Pakistan will not be able to keep this rivalry alive we, and, and, and doing it only for domestic political consumption is not in Pakistan's longer term interest. China, on the other hand, keeps Pakistan believing that, yeah, it can, it can with a little more effort, with a little more effort, you know, pump up those muscles a little bit more. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that a, 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 a sort of, you know, a, a six-year-old and a 26-year-old, how, whatever, however much you might exercise a six-year-old's arms and uh, limbs and muscles, has a disadvantage with, with, a, uh, with a bigger person. And so that... Pakistan will have to accept, but at the moment does not. Until it does not accept that, uh, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship will not straighten out. 
Mr. Stan, could you say a little bit more about what you alluded to in the beginning, the, the sort of, well, the overall geostrategic competition that's going on in South Asia with an emphasis on, on the Pakistan-China relationship, and in particular, the growing economic dependence of Pakistan on China. And I'm thinking in connection with you know, the, the, the vast amounts of debt associated with infrastructure development, the China-Pakistan economic order. Uh, what, what, situ- what, is the, what is the situation uh, in, in Pakistan in, in terms of its own sovereignty and the degree to which Pakistan has surrendered uh, a, a large measure of its sovereignty to China? Well, Pakistan has always looked for a great power patron, as I said earlier. So America was the patron of choice for many, many decades. America provided loans, provided bilateral assistance, provided military equipment, and that was fine. Now, of course, because of Afghanistan, because of the nuclear issue, because of uh, strategic uh, considerations, because of Pakistan's support for Islamist terrorism, the U.S. started backing away. Pakistan had what it called a hedging relationship with China, but that hedging relationship has now become the primary relationship for Pakistan. China has something called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is supposed to be a $66 billion investment plan in Pakistan's infrastructure over multiple years. They haven't put in all the money. They always say they talk much bigger, the Chinese, than they actually do. But 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 they have started building uh, uh, the port uh, the the port uh, city of Gwadar uh, infrastructure rail links road links at least they will enhance Pakistan's um, uh, linkages to China if not to others. The problem for Pakistan economically is that the the infrastructure it needs is essentially one that links east to west that links Pakistan's economy with India's economy, with Afghanistan's economy, with Iran's economy. Instead, what it's doing is north-south. China, which is up in the mountains, beyond the mountains, cutting across the mountains, coming to Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan-China trade is much higher than U.S.-Pakistan trade. Uh, More Pakistanis now go to China to study, then come to the United States. There are only about 7,000 Pakistani students in American universities this year, whereas there are 120,000 Pakistani students in Chinese universities. The Pakistani military and the Pakistani intelligence services have become more integrated with China. And the one bond Pakistan has with China that America can't compete with is the bond of hating or disliking India. Now, in the process, Pakistan's sovereignty has eroded. Why? Because Pakistan owes more and more of its rising debt to China. Pakistan is falling into a debt trap. Pakistan's debts previously structured through the World Bank, IMF, international financial institutions were subject to certain very specific rules. In case of China, we already know that what they do is they invoke, for example, the US and the institutions that it works through have never invoked any clause of a foreclosure on territory. Uh, That's not how the US or the West works. But China has taken over the territory around the port of Hambantota in Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka was not able to service the debts. What happens if Pakistan has faces a similar situation of not being able to service China's debt and China starts asking for uh, extraterritoriality within Pakistan? Uh, It is estimated that there will be as many as 5 million Chinese living in Pakistan within the next 15 years. And that is primarily because China brings its own labor to work on its projects. It does not hire local labor. So they bring convict labor to work in Pakistan. So they're not creating jobs for Pakistanis. They're building infrastructure and they're building it at very high cost and uh, through loans, which they keep the right to call in when they do, and sometimes using very um, overbearing ways of trying to recover the loans. So Pakistan has uh, unfortunately allowed its sovereignty to erode vis-a-vis China in its bid not to let India be the preeminent power in South Asia. And you know, Hussein, there, there are these there are predictions. You know that that the CPAC, the China-Pakistan economic quarter, is not going to pay off. Uh, that that the indebtedness uh, really is going to be a lodestone around Pakistan's neck, a country already that has huge economic and financial and energy security issues. W- what is the outlook, do you think, for Pakistan? I remember Ahmed Rashid's old saying, he used to say that Pakistan would emphasize its state weakness and, and threaten the West by holding a gun to its own head. 
Uh, but but Pakistan has always had these problems. Is it going to get worse? And do you see the potential maybe even for state collapse? Well, look, I mean, you are, of course, a scholar general. You were in the military, but you were also a scholar. But you know, you know many of your colleagues who are who are not scholars but generals, and the military is trained to do certain things. They are trained to locate the enemy and liquidate the enemy, but the military is not necessarily trained to run an economy. And the Pakistani military has never got a handle on the economy. They have taken over power directly several times. Pakistan has been under martial law, as you know. They've hired economists to help with the economy, but they have never been able to build a functioning economy. A functioning economy needs real advances in human capital. Right now, Pakistan has 32% of its school-going age children, children between the age of 5 and 15, that that don't go to school at all, 32% one of the highest out-of-school population in the world of children. And the other uh, 68% that does go to school includes people who go to madrasas, where, you know, religious seminaries, where the Taliban come out of. So these people know, learn nothing else except some understanding of a, a very uh, outmoded uh, interpretation of Islam. And, and I, should, so- I should just add for our viewers, it also entails the the rote memorization of the Quran in yes. Arabic, in Arabic. Absolutely, which, which they don't yeah. always understand. So it's always rote memorization of the Quran. It's, you know, uh, uh, but n- nothing functional, nothing that is relevant to the modern world. That is the reason why Pakistan's economy doesn't take off. Secondly, all economies that attract investment are economies that have certain, uh, that allow the rate of uh, return on investment that is, you know, uh, short, or or at least according to the the process that has been agreed to, Pakistan has on many an occasion arbitrarily cancelled contracts. So, for example, Pakistan has lost a string of international arbitrations because it alleged that the foreign companies that had invested in Pakistan uh, in, in in various projects that they had paid uh, bribes to Pakistani politicians, something that they couldn't prove. And then in the end, uh, the corporations were able to take Pakistan to the cleaners at the at the international arbitration. Uh, Pakistan has, for example, copper reserves in the province of Balochistan. Those copper reserves were to be taken out by an international company, uh, Antofagasta, which is Chile's biggest copper mining uh, company. And Pakistan canceled the, uh, 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 the contract at the last minute because uh, uh, some people thought that maybe we can do it ourselves. So, so Pakistan's hyper-nationalism, which Imran Khan represents, which Pakistan's military has encouraged over the years, and which Pakistan's some of Pakistan's Islamists embrace, that hyper-nationalism has also militated against a functioning economy. So if Pakistan does not have a functioning economy in which the there's exportable products being produced, uh, an educated labor force that can actually uh, make better products for the rest of the world, uh, where exports are, if not higher, at least comparable to imports, then all Pakistan will do is keep on accumulating debt. As far as infrastructure is concerned, infrastructure is a very good idea when something is moving on it. So if you have an airport, where there are flights coming and going, the airport pays for itself. If there's a port where ships come and go, the ship, uh, the uh, port is paying for itself. And if there's a road or a highway on which goods and services are moving, fine. In Pakistan, uh, just like in Sri Lanka, where the port of Hamid Tota was built by the Chinese, they built, built a great port, but nobody came because they already had another port. And so this was an excessive expenditure of building a more modern, fashionable port by the Chinese, but it only resulted in the Chinese taking over the town of Hambantota virtually, that, that the port and its adjoining area. Pakistan could face something similar because even the infrastructure the Chinese are building is not paying for itself because the rest of the economy is not growing. And so we will end up with ports, we will end up with railroads, we will end up with road highways, we will end up with airports many of which will not be able to pay for themselves by the amount of traffic that they generate. 
And as you alluded to, even the construction doesn't really benefit the Pakistani people because it's it's your know, Chinese banks with Chinese loans, with Chinese, Chinese loans, Chinese loans, labor, Chinese labor, Chinese engineers. Right. Yes. right. I mean, Pakistan has competent engineers, and Pakistan has a lot of excess uh, unskilled labor for 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 construction work. Uh, many of them go off uh, to the Middle East to work. So Pakistan should at least, if the, the the infrastructure project of the Chinese should at least be generating. Uh, some jobs, but they aren't. Ambassador Kai, what I'd like to do is, is uh, with the last couple of questions, talk about the future. Some people have described South Asia as the, the most dangerous place on earth because of the, the presence of jihadist terrorists, much of what we've been talking about, the, the, uh, the India-Pakistan rivalry to nuclear armed countries. What do you envision for the future? What do you see as, as maybe some of the, the dangerous alternative futures but also importantly, what we might do, right? What we, what, what we might do to help prevent the worst from happening. Well, first of all, we must realize that Afghanistan has been a disaster uh, in terms of depriving the U.S. of a military presence in the region that could actually have been a stabilizing factor, uh, keeping an eye, counterterrorism, uh, 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 sort of intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance missions, all of those could have been done from Afghanistan, and now they'll have to be done from much farther. Um, India-Pakistan rivalry. India-Pakistan rivalry was bad as it was. Now it has a new dimension. India has a Hindu nationalist government, which uh, has at least some elements uh, that are quite extreme in their views, uh, especially in opposition to Muslims. Pakistan has a Islamo nationalist government, that is more tolerant of Islamist extremists. So we may actually have a situation in which we may have people with relatively extreme views controlling two nuclear armed countries. And that may not necessarily uh, make it easy for a balance of power to be maintained and war to be avoided. Uh, lastly, there is the Islamists. Uh, the Islamists, uh, based on Pakistan's location, and based on Afghanistan's location, can end up projecting power both in the Middle East, in fact, not just the Middle East and South Asia, but also in Central Asia. So the Islamist factor is also going to be a destabilizing factor in that region. What can be done about it? Well, first of all, I think that the effort to try and change Pakistan and its uh, views is still something that needs to be undertaken, but its method has to be different. Instead of just going and talking to Pakistan's generals and telling them, why don't you change? And then them saying, oh yeah, I'm the one who's going to bring change. As long as you give me more F-16s, more military equipment and more money. Uh, instead of doing that, I think a bigger picture has to be uh, appreciated of what would it take for Pakistan to understand that its eternal competition with India will only result in Pakistan falling further and further behind. And that its total dependence on China will also result in the erosion of Pakistani sovereignty. So Pakistan needs a mix of relationships, including with the Chinese and the West, but also needs to open up relations with India. Uh, a strategy needs to be developed of how various factors will make Pakistan reach that conclusion. Um, and that may take a lot more forethought and a lot more understanding than has been given to the problem in the past. Sometimes, uh, in general, I feel that um, Americans reduce foreign policy to just three choices. Whom do we bomb? Whom can we take out for lunch? And whom can we buy out? Foreign policy sometimes requires a lot more uh, options and a lot more complex uh, interactions. And so those will be needed here. I think that the U.S. has a good relationship with India right now. I, uh, but then between India and the Middle Eastern countries that are friends of uh, the United States, there's a whole spot of trouble. Pakistan is not fully a reliable American partner. Afghanistan has just fallen under the hands of uh, people who will hate the United States. Iran is already negatively disposed. And then further up, Turkey is also led by a maverick leader who is not in the same uh, sort of uh, uh, 
who is not an ally of the United States in the same way that previous Turkish leaders were. So the United States needs to have a broader policy for South Central uh, Asia in which it re, uh, reworks its relationships and its partnerships. And uh, um, getting Afghanistan right will be important. Getting Pakistan right will be important and continuing to build on the relationship with India without uh, letting that relationship also become subject to new, a new set of delusions that the Chinese, that the Indians will fight the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and uh, we, we, that there will be some kind of, uh, that we will be able to pa pass on our security considerations to somebody else. That, that, that those kind of delusions should be avoided. And that region needs a lot more attention than it is being given. I think that uh, President Biden's attitude has been that he will compete with China or he will face China, but he will do that in East Asia and South Asia and Central Asia are somehow irrelevant. And that attitude, I don't think, will work. Gosh, and, and I would I would add even so Southwest Asia is a, a critical arena of competition as well. Absolutely. And I think what we're seeing is a whole range of hedging behavior on the side of the Gulf states based on our continued declarations of our desire to, to leave the Middle East and to view it uh, ma mainly as a mess to be avoided. <laughs> leaving, leaving, leaving regions when you want to be a global leader is never a good idea. And yes, yes, I absolutely agree with those who say that we can't uh, go guns blazing everywhere. But then nor is the solution just leaving everywhere and saying, okay, well, why don't you come and meet us for lunch day after tomorrow? That's not going to work either. We have to work with what we have. We have to project power where we need to project power. And at the same time, understand the regions as well and understand the local dynamics too, instead of simplifying it to our convenience and then realizing that we didn't succeed and then shrugging our shoulders and walking away. That is certainly not the behavior of a global leader. Right. Sustained and sustainable engagement that prioritizes our interests, recognizes the limits of our agency, but I think also recognizes that problems that develop abroad can only be dealt with at an exorbitant cost once they reach our shores. And absolutely, you know, you know Ambassador Akani, I think our nation is is very fortunate because people like you still immigrate to our country, right? And and and, and I think recognize the great promise of America. At this time of, I think, pessimism, and maybe rightfully so in connection with international affairs, I wonder if you might share a little bit of your story, of your, your personal journey uh, to become a U.S. citizen and, and, uh, and, and really after doing everything you could uh, to, to advance the, the interests of the Pakistani people, why you concluded to come to the United, to, to the United States and, and what your goals are now here as a, as a scholar at the Hudson Institute. Well, um, I, I have, uh, you know, been a friend of the United States long before I set foot in the United States. Uh, I'm a product of uh, an era in which the US maintained libraries in third world countries in an effort to uh, win over hearts and minds against the Soviets. Um, and I was an admirer of the United States, uh, of the principles of the United States. Of course, I don't admire some of the things that are happening in the country right now, but there are things that needed, that, that the basic principles on which this country was founded. And I came here 20, more than 21 years ago uh, to be in exile when I felt that my life was not uh, secure in Pakistan. Then in between, I became Pakistan's ambassador to the US when the government changed and the military regime made way for a democratic government. Uh, throughout, my objective has always been to try and find a way in which Pakistan and its people can succeed. Um, the problem in Pakistan has been that they have a strategic vision, uh, which basically uh, is does not, it, it, it sets Pakistan's national purpose as eternal competition with India and an eternal battle to try and get Kashmir. Whereas Pakistan needs a national purpose that focuses on its own population and its welfare and its growth and its progress. So I've done all my best for Pakistan throughout, and I will continue to do so. Pakistan is one of those countries that allows dual citizenship. So even if you take citizenship of uh, the United States, you continue to be a citizen of Pakistan. Uh, I've spent many years in the US writing. 
a lot of it about Pakistan, but also about radical Islamism. And my goal now is, in the remaining years of my life, to try and see if, uh, as a new American, I can educate more uh, uh, older Americans into understanding the rest of the world. The world is not a problem for America to solve. The world is a situation for America to understand. And people who understand the complexities of other cultures, other societies, and other countries can actually contribute to America's ability to make policy about those other cultures, other societies, and other countries. And that is precisely the nature of my work right now. Well, Ambassador Rikani, what a perfect way to close. On, on behalf of the Hoover Institution, thank you for being with us. And thanks, thank you for helping us learn more about battlegrounds important to building a future of peace and prosperity for generations to come. Thank you. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.